Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cabbage Experience. Today, we're going to do something different. Usually on the, on the Jason Cabbage Experience, we do like 30 to 45 minute interviews over Zoom. Today, I'm going to do doing the first in a series of in-depth interviews where we're going to go more in-depth with our guests. Uh, the Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by the of Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies for foreign and free people. According to the SBA, there's over 5 million small companies in the United States. Most have, don't have HR because an internal HR person is 70000 or more per year plus benefits. And HR consultants is overcharged on price and delivery on value. Cabinets HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Laura Beth Christensen. Laura, are you ready to be great today? Ready. Laura Beth is a co-founder and owner of Leverage Benefits Consulting since 2010. She has been featured in Courageous Women's Magazine as one of the top 25 courageous women in business. She was recently featured on the Ben and Trey podcast, which was focused on people who lived or grew up in rural Eastern Washington. She has been featured in the National Outbound Conference by Jeb Blount for Success in Business. Her firm has been ranked number one, the number one agency for the past seven years. And she was personally recognized as the nation's top sales agent for one specific career in 2017 and 2018. The domestic violence in the 90s caused her homelessness for the three kids, causing her to sleep in her car in the, in the rest here on I-5. However, while homeless, she started community college and became the first person in all generations of her family to attend a complete college. She graduated cum laude from Seattle University with criminal justice and communication and journalism, journalism degrees was a lieutenant in a men's detention facility and was the director of Women and Children's Homeless Shelter Programs. She has been a keynote speaker on homelessness issues in Washington, as well as a speaker on courage to change your life, to change your life. After the recession of 20, 2008, she decided to start her own business consulting for businesses on compliance and benefits, needs and solutions. And she currently runs a multi-million dollar consulting firm serving the entire country, which is headquartered in Western Washington. Her clients are companies from 10 to 10,000 employees providing services that address the trends affecting the industry and employee needs. Laura Beth, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Laura, talk about growing up in what I call the country. <laughs> like I'm a country kid myself. Like talk about like how, how, how life was and is growing up in a country of, is it advantage or disadvantage in the world today, you think? I think perspective is everything. And growing up in the country, I grew up in a place that had no stoplights. There was one stop sign. Uh, it was one straight mile. And we lived on 10 acres. So at that time, was it an advantage or disadvantage? It was horrible as a child. You're isolated. You spend a lot of time living in a bubble Everything that happens, happens on your property. And for me, getting away from that was extremely important for me. So did you grow up like hunting and fishing? Do you, you have the <laughs> typical country life or? <laughs> I, I grew up hunting, fishing, scrounging through the dump because you'd find treasures. I was probably eight or nine years old, the first time I shot a shotgun and got knocked on my butt. Um, I was taught early how to be outside, be comfortable outside, and appreciate the outdoors. So when did you first learn that, you know, there's more of the world than this country life? Like there's something, like you said, this, this bubble. When you learn, I would say there's something besides the bubble. Well, I think as a teenager, you start to think there's something else out there. And keep in mind, this wasn't when everyone watched hours and hours of television. So I didn't see it there. In fact, we didn't have a television uh, at that time. So you spend a lot of time outside riding horses, uh, slaughtering animals. I participated in that. I'm sure that hurts some people, but I, I'm pretty sure they were there for me to eat them. So... Uh, so I learned farming and all those things, but I knew there had to be something else. Uh, we moved out of the country and then I swore I would never wanted to go back to that. And now I miss it desperately. So people like who live in the country now, 
what, is, what can they do to like, take advantage of that? Like, suppose they, they want to be successful businessmen or do some more mm-hmm. of the life. What do they do? I mean, I'm sure it's pretty easier now in 2020 than it was, you know, back in the 90s or 80s or 2000s, right? Well, think about it. We're sitting here having a conversation that can go to anyone in the world. So now there's an opportunity that people can use their phones, their, their internet, their computers, get information and decide what they want to do with their lives, no matter where they are. So yes. you can build a business and you can build the mindset first so that you can go find a way to create what you want. Yes. Next, let's move to uh, domestic violence, which you have, unfortunately you have some experience with. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, it's really important for me that people understand that domestic violence, it shapes who you are as a person. And for me, domestic violence was rampant in my family as a child. So the first time I was homeless was five years old. And some people call it running away. And I called it survival. So at five years old, I was witnessing so much violence in the home that to me, it seemed safer to be in the woods, in the dark, alone at five years old than to be in a house where I felt like my life was in danger. So at five years old, I left and it was well over 24 hours. I stayed in the dark under a tree and felt safer than I did in that home. Uh, My mom had a cycle of marrying abusive people. So that violence continued through my uh, pre-adolescence and teen years. I watched my brother be knocked unconscious while he was doing the dishes. I watched my mom beaten brutally until she was unconscious and drug through the house to the sink so that her abuser could splash water on her face and try to revive her. Um, And I experienced some pretty serious violence myself that I have scars on my body from weapons I was beaten with. Um, So for me, I got to a place where living in violence Well, to be clear, people who experience that as children tend to be angry and assertive and aggressive uh, as they're trying to figure that out and navigate that. So I had a commitment to myself that I wouldn't live with that as an adult. So when I got married and things got escalated to pushing and shoving, uh, and I had my first experience of domestic violence, I had three children. And within an hour, I had my kids loaded up in my car, nowhere to go, no money, and just refused to participate in it. But to be really clear, people who stay, there's nothing wrong with that either if they're trying to navigate a time to move on from that domestic violence. And there are great resources available now that I didn't have access to. Um, But again, sleeping in my car, or being homeless was a better alternative than to being in a room with someone that I had to fear for my life. Do you ever think back to your, like your five-year-old self and think, man, how courageous I was back then? Like, I mean, most five-year-old kids, like they're playing Pokemon Go or, you know, (laughs) preschool. And you're like, you're like, man, you're like surviving. Like, do you ever think back and and go to the thought process? Um, I honestly, I appreciate that question. I, don't think I've ever thought she was a little five-year Rosie the Riveter, I could do it. I don't think I ever thought about it that way. I think I lived in a world of fear. All of it was fear. And my fear of the brutality was enough to make me do or go wherever I thought I'd be safe. You know, I had experiences at 10 years old. I had the same thing. It was when I was watching people being beaten unconscious in my house that I packed up and walked down a freeway in Montana and was found by the police. And at that point, I told everything that was happening at home. And in the 70s, the police weren't social workers and they called it a domestic issue and took me back home where the violence just got worse. So there were two occasions under 11 years old that 
I never really thought of it as being strong or courageous. I thought of it for survival. So is, do your mother marry multiple times? It's the same, the same person. My mom time? was married five times. And all of them so were abusive far. people. Yes. So why do you think people do this? Like, it's like, I mean, I think stats show that you know, once you're in an abusive relationship, you keep going to, mm -hmm. to like do it over and over again. The same mm -hmm. guy, the same type of person. Is it because like you just, the person being abused just sees the good in the person and wants to try to work it out mm -hmm. or they feel trapped or like, mm -hmm. what do you think that is? I think that's a great question for a psychiatrist. But if I were going to try to answer those questions, I would extend grace to people who pick partners that are abusive by comparing it to why do any of us repeat poor choices or bad decisions? Why does someone who drinks and drives and has a wreck or gets a ticket, why do they do it again? Why does someone who overeats and has a medical crisis and the physician tells them you have to eliminate that, but yet they repeat it? Or a smoker, who knows what it could do to them, and they repeat it, right? So human beings, we have a tendency to repeat behaviors, even if they're not good for us. You can look at our society and see that. In domestic violence, I think a lot of the research shows, and it bears out when you look at the situations, that people are drawn to similar types of people. And oftentimes, abusers are so charming. They know that they can be explosive. They know their previous relationships. So the next relationship, they really turn on the charm and the love and the kindness. And so the person thinks, maybe I found someone who's not going to be bad to me. And then as soon as it starts developing, there's that dance of, is this it? Is it going to get worse? Did I find another person like this? How far have they gone into that relationship and gotten themselves stuck, if you will? It'll be tough to get out. What kind of isolation has that person used to keep them to themselves so it's harder to get out? Um, I, don't th I, I don't think anyone, male or female, seeks out a relationship with someone that will beat them brutally. But with you, as soon as you had your first indicator, you was out of there, right? Oh, the, the moment we had the first shoving and I ended up with some bruises, I was gone. At the time you had three kids, how old were your kids then? Five, three, and just under a year. And so I think it's hard enough for someone to leave a abusive relationship just by themselves, right? You had like basically four people had to take care of, right? You and three kids. Mm -hmm. Like, how did that play in your thought process? I mean, I'm, did you like, did. did you have any like help from your family? It was just you by yourself, right? So there was not a thought process. A thought process would have fed the fear of how and what's going to happen. How do I feed them? What am I going to do? I took the position of no matter what, if someone I'm married to is not going to respect me, I have to respect myself enough to just leap out into that abyss, if you will, not knowing what would happen. I had a very small two-door Honda Prelude. I had three little boys that I loaded up in that car, and I had nowhere to go. I had no family. I had no one. My family's from Texas now. They all live in Texas. And so my mom and my sister were in Texas, which would have been my resources. So I drove up and down I-5. And they, uh, just before 5, the Tacoma rest stop area, I just parked in between semi-trucks and slept in the car. Did anybody ever like knock on your car door like, hey, you know, I see this car here every day. You know, what are you doing here or <laughs> what's going on? No. I, sometimes I wonder if the drivers of those trucks ever wondered what we were doing. It's tough to get comfortable and sleep in a Honda Prelude, too. And I have to match this tough to sleep in a truck stop, you know, I mean. 
I mean, I know they're relatively safe, but still it's a truck stop yeah. ride and you never know who's coming through or not coming through, you know, and yeah, we're three kids. I can imagine like that stuff going through your mind at the time. Yeah, it was, it was, um, scary. And at the same time, I really practiced this mindfulness that I didn't know was mindfulness then of no matter how scared I am, I have to do this. Now, did you have a job at this time? No. Uh, I had lost my job because of the domestic violence. Uh, my ex assaulted me while I was at UW Hospital with my sister having a baby, tore all the ligaments in my right knee, and I didn't have disability insurance or accident insurance which I should have, uh, I didn't have any of those things. And so I couldn't go to work. I had to have surgery and the employer wasn't required to keep me on, not knowing when I would come back. So I had lost my job. That's what generated the thought process of maybe college makes my life different and I could support three kids by myself. From the time you left your husband how long is it between the time you left your husband and you started college? A week. A week? Oh, wow. So let me tell you how amazing. That's fast. Yeah. You, There's I no don't think you around could do it. You're like, you, you, you're going to make some, something happen. I need solutions and I need to achieve those. Um, and sometimes some of us are motivated by uh, extreme discomfort. It really gets you going. So some people, it, it paralyzes them. And... They can't move forward. And some people, it's like lighting a firecracker. <laughs> you, you've got to make some decisions quick. I had three little people who were not responsible for my situation. And I had to make things change quickly. And at the time, you only had a high school diploma, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, to clarify, my high school diploma is a high school diploma. However, at 16, I was pregnant. At 17, I didn't attend my regular high school. I attended Green River Community College and spent a full year earning the credits I needed for a diploma. So I had that. Okay. And so you, you, and within seven days, like, I got to do something with my life. This, <laughs> this isn't my future for me and my kids. And so, so you started college. So I've always wondered when or how I could ever give a shout out, if you will to the people at that college. Because I was in the South End, I drove up to Highline Community College. Again, no one in my family had been to college, never had a conversation. I had no idea what that involved. I walked into the administrative buildings. I really don't know who I asked, where to go, what to do, but I somehow communicated that I thought I needed to go to college and that I had three kids and we were living in my car. And there are great grants that were available that I think still are, but there was a Washington Women in Need grant. And then of course, Pell grants and things like that. Every single person that I interacted at that campus, um, they were all women, but every single one of them said, you're going to start classes next week. And we're going to get the money worked out. And they did. I think it's a good lesson for everyone out there. Like, no matter your situation, those people want to help you, right? You just got to ask. You got you to make the first effort. I mean. So what I wouldn't do, I wouldn't go to the welfare office. I wouldn't get any financial assistance. Um, I didn't get any food stamps. So the shame of doing that kept me from doing some things I probably should have at that time. But the money came together from all the grants and I could use that to feed my kids. How did the daycare for your kids work out? Was there a program back then where they took care of your kids or? The school had a program that helped with that. So my oldest was in kindergarten. So I had to drive him to school. And then the younger two got to go to a babysitter. And then I would go to the college campus and then go back and pick them up. I made the mistake well, you know, a week before school, what classes are left available, right? <laughs> so I ended up in a French class 
my first quarter ever going to college. Never taken a foreign language before. Uh, so in my Honda Prelude, I had cassette tapes. <laughs> and I would plug in the cassette tape and drive up and down I-5 and try to practice French. So when in college, when did you decide the degrees you wanted? Like, how did that come about? What made you focus on criminal justice? Yeah, I don't know if I was like most people who don't know till they're almost done. Or I don't know if most people actually know before they ever go. What I knew was I wasn't an A student in high school. And I had a lot of catching up to do. So my first two years getting an associate's degree was just how do I get through these basic things and get an AA. So it was all the prerequisites, catching up on math and things that I wasn't really strong in. When it came time to finish the associates and I knew I had to go somewhere, I knew I needed to transfer to another school. I literally just walked in to the planning office at the college and started looking at all the books on the shelf of schools. And they told me that Seattle U only had 20 to 25 people in a class at that time. And I thought that's the way I learn. So I want to go there. Uh, so I applied and I got accepted. Was there any doubts in your mind? <laughs> well, I didn't know it was a Jesuit school. So for clarification, I'm not Catholic. So I had no idea that I was stepping into that. My first quarter at Seattle U, I cried almost every night. And I can vividly remember sitting at my, I had a little table like you have me sitting at now that I did all my homework. And I can remember sitting there crying and saying out loud to myself, you're not smart enough for a university. And in one of my classes, they passed out the syllabus and it said FR Cobb was the instructor. And I laughed and I said, I'm at a university with typos. And someone looked at me and said, that means father. Whoops. <laughs> 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 I thought it was Mr. Cobb. He was one of my favorite teachers. Uh, but I cried a lot and I had just two people that I used as a resource at that time. And I told them, I don't think I can do it. And it was the first time I thought I was going to quit. And they said, look what you've been through. Look what you've done. You're not going to quit. And so I never quit. It's amazing. Even nowadays, like people who you think are like famous and like know they're known, they admit like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an imposter. Mm -hmm. Even like people like you're a superstar. Hey, what you do? Mm -hmm. How can you be an imposter? Right. Mm -hmm. But everyone has it. Right. You just got to deal with it. I'm fascinated by the whole imposter syndrome. I have a great friend, Fiona McKay, and we talk a lot about especially how that affects women, that no matter how successful we are, we're always afraid someone's going to find out we're not really that good, we're not really that smart, we've done a great job pretending, and I'm very transparent at this point in my life and very candid. And I can tell you that last night I sat with some thoughts thinking, who am I? And what if people find out I'm really a simple country girl <laughs> that just happens to make business work, but I'm still pretty simple, I think. Yeah. Like me, like, I, one of my pet peeves when someone says they're an expert in anything, right? You're like, mm -hmm. are you really an expert? Like HR, a lot of people say, I'm an HR expert. Are you really an HR yeah. expert? So you know everything about HR, about, you know, everything about benefits, culture, employee, and, you know, even like social media market, all these so-called experts, right? Are you really an expert? Like, you know, every single thing. It just drives me crazy, right? You're probably not an expert. I don't think I've ever used the term, I'm an expert at anything. And I'm pretty good at some things. I can bake like there's no tomorrow. Uh, I've never viewed myself as an expert or the best or I know I'm good at things I do, but I spend all my time trying to improve, which includes 
studying, listening, reading, attending, going wherever it takes to get better, which includes getting better as a person. Yes. Laura, Beth, talk about why it's important for you to tell your story. Hmm. Well, right now, our world is in a serious crisis and people are really struggling. And so when things weren't the way they are now, I used to really pride myself in being able to just encourage people. Now, the way things are, I feel like there are a lot of people who don't feel like they can keep going. There are businesses who have lost everything that they've built. There are families who have unemployed parents that are struggling to make ends meet. And right now, more than ever, this story about a simple girl who lived on 10 acres and had to bale hay and never thought she'd accomplish anything. For me to tell the story about being beaten and battered and abused emotionally, mentally, physically, and the story of overcoming and the story of digging deep to push through college with three children. For me, I feel like that just might be the fuel that people need to know that, especially now, as hard as life is, they can get through it and they can still create the life that they want. You know, we're always recruiting and right now we're adding a couple new people to our team my message to people is no matter how old you are no matter what you've experienced this business is led by people who have really suffered and been at the bottom and took it all the way to the top and we can show other people that it's possible no matter how discouraged or disheartened they are by their current situation. And if I don't tell my story, it sounds like lip service, it's lip service to people. We've all heard people say, oh, it'll be okay. Oh, you'll be fine. Oh, it's gonna get better. But are those people who have lived it? Are those people who know how to make it better? Or is it lip service? Um, so for us, it is in my bones who I am. Every inch of me standing tall is built from struggle. And I know I can show people by telling my story that they can get through any difficulty and make the life that they want. So Laura Beth, how do you deal with people out there who are like maybe kind of had it easy in life and they just <laughs> give up, right? And they didn't have your challenges, you don't have your drive. And the first obstacle they give up, like, how do you deal with those kind of people? Do you get mad at them? Do you have empathy for them? Do you try to help them out? Do you try, try to tell your story? Or how do you deal with that? You know, I said back at the beginning that living in a violent situation tends to make you an angry person. I'm so fortunate at this point that my journey has been about growing and learning who I am. And I'm I'm known for, and I'm very proud of, that I extend a lot of grace to people, sometimes too much. Uh, I've heard it all from people who, I can't go to school because I have a full-time job, so I don't have time. I've heard, I can't go to school because I have one child, and there's, it's just too hard, I won't have time. I think we're all different, we're all built different, and honestly, but for the grace of God, I could have been in an alley shooting heroin because my life was so difficult. I just didn't go that route. Um, so people, uh, let me go back to smoking, overeating, bad relationships. We make bad decisions. People make bad decisions sometimes. And we repeat those decisions. And the same is true for excuses. So anyone who says, oh, it's just too hard. There's just no way. 
and they won't do the work, they're just making excuses because sometimes people have to eliminate the pain and the difficulty. And the way to eliminate it is to say that there's an excuse why they can't do it. And some people, like myself, have had to embrace the pain. And then you get to where you're used to that. And there's no obstacle that you're going to turn and run from. You, every obstacle I face ever, even if it's tough in the moment, I will pause and then regroup. Okay, how do I overcome this? I won't run. And so for the people who do, I just have to extend grace that they're doing the very best they can with what they know and the tools that they've got emotionally, psychologically, experientially. Um, and only people who want to change that and want to break down barriers and push forward will do that. Listen, I took a long time for my self learners. Like, you know, if people don't want to help, you can't force help on them, right? It took me the longest right. time to learn that lesson. Like, you see the good of people, they can, you know, you can do better, but sooner or later, they have to, you have to do it themselves and you have to wait, stop wasting your time helping them. Yeah. And it's a hard lesson I had to learn. Yeah. So I, there's a couple of phrases we use, of course, leading a horse to water, right? Not making them drink, pushing a wet noodle. Um, but there's one I really like which is called fail them fast in your circle with the people around you. When you realize they don't have what it takes to do what it takes to push through, or they don't have the desire, you have to know when to let go for your own personal circle. Laura Beth, one of your passions is helping out, helping out the homeless, correct? Mm, yes, it is. How do we solve this or deal with, deal with this? Is it, is, is it even solvable? Cause you know, people, th we've thrown millions of dollars, a problem, you know, I mean, and, the, and then see like city for programs like Seattle, San Francisco, LA, which puts a lot of money out on the homelessness, mm -hmm. the homeless population is just increasing. Mm -hmm. Is it, I mean, how do we solve this? Is it, are homeless people going mm -hmm. to like cities like Seattle, San Francisco, LA, because there's more opportunity there. So the homeless population increases or I mean, it's just a dynamic that seems like it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. So my background after being homeless, I was actually the director here downtown Seattle at the YWCA for women and children. I then went and worked at Snohomish County and I was in the funding side of housing and economic de development. So working with shelter programs. So I was on the 10 year plan to end homelessness, which it's been five years since that 10 years ended and clearly homelessness didn't. I have a couple different thoughts about it. Um, we won't end homelessness to answer your question first on that. The money that's being thrown at cities or that cities are throwing at the problem is obviously not solving any of it. There are people who for lots of reasons you could line up housing and give them all a place to live and they don't want to be in it i've witnessed someone that we provided housing to that the homelessness was a safer feeling for her and she gave us a key back and walked out and went back on the streets it's not true that the majority of homeless people are drug addicts or alcoholics it's not true at all. You can do the research and see. Um, programs are very limiting. Well, first, look at where do the dollars go? The reality is I managed the budgets at the YWCA. Um, there's administrative costs, and there's a lot of it. And so the money's not all going to providing services or resources. And then the screening processes and the elimination of if you are using drugs or alcohol, you can't even get into any of the programs. You have to be clean and sober first. Um, and I thought you doing that on your own is probably slim to none. Yeah, exactly. Well, and we know that even in recovery, three out of 10 are able to maintain that long term. It's a terrible, terrible disease. And we need the money and the resources 
to deal with that, but yet there's less money for treatment or there's only 14 day treatment programs, which we know is not sufficient. So I'm an advocate for people to be cognizant of homelessness, but the real issues and the real needs. One of the keynote speaking I did for the Interfaith Task Force on Homelessness, I said, if there's a hurricane or there's a tsunami or there's a catastrophic event, you'll turn on your TV or your radio and you'll hear text to this number and you can donate money. And millions of dollars are donated within hours. You can look at the tsunami in Thailand and the earthquakes and Hurricane Katrina and look at the donations that come. And why do those donations come? Because people with big hearts are broken about the fact that people have just lost their safety, security, their housing, and they want to help them, right? They don't blame them for why they've lost their housing. In our society, we blame homeless people for why they don't have housing. So we look away when we see them. We pull up to a stoplight and they're standing there flying a sign and we turn our head away, not at them. And we avoid facing them and we avoid donating money or time to help because we blame them for their situation. And as long as we blame a person for where they're at, we won't have compassion to help them. So one thing I never understood, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but <clears throat> I believe like suppose you, it, it's hard to get to a mystery or the homeless. It's hard, it's hard to get in, but you have to be like out by in the morning and mm -hmm. then you have to be gone all day long take all your mm -hmm. stuff with you and you have to stay in line to get in at five o'clock, right? Yeah. So there are different kinds of shelter programs. Uh, most of the majority of the men's programs in our state are evening sleep programs. Get up, get out. So yeah, you're carrying everything you have. And how can you go to a job interview or, or do anything? Right. I like, I, I don't, I never understood that. How do you go to a job interview? There's no showers in these shelters. There's day centers for showers that you can also line up to try to get to that. How do you go to a job interview if you don't have a phone number for them to call you and tell you you're hired? How do you do it when you don't have an address to list? Um, so there are shelter programs that are mail stops where people can receive mail, or you can get a voicemail that you can go in and just dial the voicemail and check it. There are some programs like that, very, very limited. But how does someone go to a job interview when they're carrying everything they own? And it's not all like the Will Smith movie. You don't all get to go get a suit and, and get a great job. And it's not that easy. No, I'm not saying that that story was an easy story, but there's an example of someone who really was going to push through no matter what. Um, it's really easy to succumb to the suffering of being homeless. And I I've also I think a lot of people, they, they, they I don't, I don't, I don't want to say they become content. They get used to it, right? They're like, this is my life. And they just do the routine over and over again. Mm. Well, I, I think rather than getting used to it, it's how to tolerate it. That's good. Yeah. That's so good, why good would word. you, why would you drink a $2 bottle of mad dog? When you're homeless well one it's the most affordable and two it's going to numb the pain so if you picture someone who had a major accident and crushed their ankle and they can't walk the pain is terrible so they find a way to get rid of the pain right they get medication it hurts to walk so they sit and elevate it what you do is figure out how do i tolerate this pain make it bearable to get to the next five minutes or five hours or five days. And as it continues, it becomes survival. And I also speak, when I speak on homelessness issues, I also speak about the PTSD involved in homelessness. It is similar to any other PTSD. It creates a trauma 
It creates events. It's dangerous to be on the streets. And those events create trauma. And then as you go through the rest of your life, the fear of homelessness can re-trigger the exact feeling that you had when you were on the street or in the car, in the rest stop, and your heart beating and being terrified that you're not safe. And there's a lot of crime and violence that does happen in homelessness. I often wonder if Seattle is it like in Seattle, is it harder to find parking or is it harder to find a public bathroom? Mm, that's a great question. Remember at the beginning when I said I desperately would love to be back in the country? <laughs> I'm avoiding the city as much as possible these days. Um, it's tough finding parking. Right now, you can't find a public restroom at all. <laughs> no one will let you in. <laughs> yeah. And even the, even the regular days, like if you're homeless, you, you're not going to let you in because you buy some. So, you, so you're homeless, you'll know where your bathroom. That's I think the only place in this area that I know a lot of them go to the library, hang out there. And, Which is closed now yeah. because of COVID, right? I know that there are mm, the porta potties that are down on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. We just did a photo session, photo shoot, if you will visit down on the waterfront and they still have a couple down there. So this is my, my solution to homelessness <laughs> and it's not perfect. Right. And, oh, and, and I, I, it might work. so now, now don't be wrong. There's a lot of homeless people who like, you know, have like burn bridge with their families, you know, they stole stuff from them, having to deal with them. But I, I just, I mean, every homeless person, they have to have some a family they can go to. Right. <clears throat> no, I, no, no. So I, I think some do. I mean, I think a lot of pride. Oh, some do. I wanted to respond to you saying every homeless person has a family or somewhere they could go. Well, we'll say the ones that do. Okay. I think it's a matter of them having too much pride hmm. and saying like, you know, cause I think like, like I just think if someone had a, had a cousin or family member, you know, my cousin or whoever is in the street, my friend, they would do the right thing and help them out. You're a Southern boy. <laughs> yeah. Actually. Yeah. I'm, I'm from Texas too. Yeah. <laughs> That's so I, the I just, way we I just, do it. I just think South. that they would do, I just think it's too much fun. Like me, I said that, but I know if I was homeless, I wouldn't ask no one for help. I mean, I know I wouldn't, right? I would try to stick it out and make things my own way. I just think they'd ask someone for help. Mm -hmm. Now, like I said, they burn bridges maybe, or they don't have family. I mean, it has to be a friend. It has to be someone that can ask for help. It's a matter of either they don't want to, or they don't, don't know how, or, or can't, you know? Well, I don't so, know So how tear that theory apart. I don't know how familiar you are with the evil giant called shame. Yeah. So in drug and shame, alcohol pride, and recovery, yeah. shame for your situation and where you are can paralyze you. I have two brothers, two sisters, a mom, a dad, cousins, uh, not one of them would I have felt like I could call and say I'm homeless and I need you to help me. Part of that was shame. And part of it is there are some of us who say, no matter how hard it is, damn it, I'm going to fix it myself. And that would be me. Like I, I said what I just said, but I, I'm being a hypocrite here. I would, <laughs> I would be the same way. I wouldn't ask for no help. I would just like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm like, yeah. <clears throat> So I'm being a kind of a hypocrite right now. Well, but the reality is, is just because someone's our family doesn't mean we want to be on their couch and be a burden and let the choices we made, because all of our best choices have led us to where we are at any given moment, right? So the choices I made had me in that situation. Why should someone else be put out because of my choices? But the shame, you know, the shame for me, a marriage that didn't work with every single person who told me it will never work. So they could say, I told you so. The only reason my family ended up involved is I cared more about my kids and still do to this day than myself. And so I had one friend, it started snowing while I was homeless in my car, who said, you need a place to stay where it's warm. Come to my apartment. And I brought my three kids and they're bouncing around her living room. They're happy to be in a house where it's warm and watch TV. And I felt so miserable 
that it wasn't my space. I'm taking her space because of my choices. So the night that I stayed at her house, I heard a loud noise at three o'clock in the morning and I was in the habit of not sleeping well. And my car that was in her parking lot was being repossessed because she was the only friend I really had when I bought that car and I listed her as a personal reference. And in case you ever default on your loan, they go looking for those references. They just happened to send a tow truck to her address that night to see if my car was there. And it was. And so the next morning, now I'm homeless with three kids and now no car. So at that point, what matters most? My children. So I called my mom, got on a Greyhound bus, took my kids to Texas, left them there and came back home to try to secure housing and provide a place for them to live. I know it had to be hard for you to leave your kids behind as a mother. Brutal, brutal. And all three of them got the chicken pox while they were away. <clears throat> so every phone call of them crying and wanting their mom was another painful reminder of my choices. And some people said to me, you lost your meal ticket. You chose to leave him. You could have stayed. And I had those things burning through my brain. And still I knew I had to do what was right for me and my children. So I went and got housing and got them back home. And can you imagine what your life would have been like if you stayed with him? Like how totally different it would be? Like just like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you don't think about that, but just imagine like. <laughs> no. I, man, so when I look at his life now, and he's the father of my kids, so I know I, I get updates on what's happening. I feel sad for him. And where I see my life is, he may have had a tremendously successful life had we stayed together, because I still was the person I was and would push through no matter what. Unfortunately for him, he's had no success, multiple marriages, no success in relationship, but no success in career or stability in that way. And I feel actually really bad for him. Um, <clears throat> I don't regret leaving. It was the right thing to do. And it was the right thing to set an example for my children. I had three sons. I had to show them you can't treat women this way. Um, and he went out of his way to avoid supporting his kids, changing social security numbers to not pay child support. I didn't even know you could do that, change social security oh, numbers. Oh, let me tell you. I had no it idea was, it was possible. <laughs> so it was a that's, little that's different. A, that's a different level right there. So I've heard of people think. avoiding child payment, but that's, that's a whole different uh -huh. level right there. Uh -huh. So in the 90s, it was a little different. If you applied for a job, they said write down your social security number. And usually that was sufficient. If they said show your social security number or provide a copy of it, he would just change the last digit. So because it was a one, he could make it a four, he could make it a seven, he would alter it. And if he got caught, as soon as I found out where he worked, I would report it. He would just quit the job and go to a next. The moral of that story is I had three children who needed to eat and needed a roof over their heads, who all played sports all year round and needed different shoes and different equipment for every sport. And he wasn't going to help. And I had to do whatever it took to be able to accommodate that. So. I feel bad that he doesn't have the story that I have of the success after 20 or 30 years of life, but I feel at peace that I did what I had to do. So let's move to 2008. 2008, your entrepreneur journey started, you started a company. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your entrepreneur journey? Why did you become a business owner? What was it, <laughs> you know, how that come about? Well, without getting into a lot of, old news and political stuff. I worked for Snohomish County at the time. 
and it was a great job. Everybody wants a government job, good benefits, right? I thought I had secured, here's the way I'm finally going to take care of my family forever. I'll be fine. Uh, people are probably familiar, some people are, that back in those days in Sonomish County, there was quite a scandal brewing and the county executive got caught having an affair and there was all kinds of harassment and discrimination and hiding people's stories of reporting it. And I happened to work in a department where four women were reporting similar harassment and abuse, if you will. And it didn't go well for any of us, and I was one of them. And so three other women who I respect wildly and I'm still in touch with left. They quit good jobs and went to other career options to avoid the sexual harassment and abuse that was happening. I tried to stomp my feet and hold my ground and say, I'm not going to tolerate this, but I'm not going to run from it. I ended up getting laid off in the recession but not because of the recession. They it found was, another they way. They just use it as, as an excuse. They needed to get rid of me. And I was a loud voice and they needed to quiet that. And so within six months after I was let go, all the stories came out. They all hit the media and it was really broad, the cover-ups of the abuse and the harassment. So at that point, I don't, there was just something in me that said, I, I'm not going to go back and work for someone. I could go work anywhere at that point. I had been the director at the YWCA, the director at Volunteers of America, a great position at the county. There's lots of places I could have went and gotten a job, if you will. I had this burning feeling inside of me that I was always meant to be a business leader and owner. And that just seemed like the time to dive in face first. It was a belly flop, just to be clear. <laughs> um, at this time, can you talk about starting a business career at this, this at your stage of your life? Because you're not right out of college, you know. Right. You're like you're you have some experience, you know. You you know, a lot of people think you start a business, especially in New York, Seattle, we're in the tech world, right? You got to be a young college student. You got to be young, you know, young go getter. But in actually, mm -hmm. a lot of people already start starting businesses. How yeah. did that come about? I was 44 years old, so I just had my 54th birthday last month, and it's funny, I wish I had done this much, much sooner, but the universe knows timing is always right, and back to what I said a little bit ago, no matter how old you are, no matter how difficult it is, you can always create the life that you want. If you just get around people who will help you and encourage you to stay focused on achieving those things and not giving up or quitting. So for me, I was 44 years old. I was starting something brand new. I had to get an insurance license. I didn't know the first thing about any of it. And I dove in and just decided I'm going to make this work. And my first year was brutal. Uh, Fortunately, my kids were older and some of them doing their own thing at that point. And so I didn't have as many people I was responsible for. And so then it created the opportunity to say, well, no one else is depending on me. So I have time to figure this out. So I don't have to give up if the first year is hard. And thankfully I didn't because it's been wildly successful since then. So this is off topic a little bit, this popped in my head. I want to talk about this before I forget. Go ahead. So I think me and you both do networking the same. Mm. Because I listen to podcasts yet. I think it's got like Benning Square, I think. <laughs> and like, like I'm the same way. Like, I'm not going to go like, like, you know, walk the room. But like me yeah. personally, like whenever I'm networking, I'm like a group of three people and someone comes up and says, hey, I'm John, blah, blah, blah. I get like mad, right? Like, well, <laughs> you're just going to come and interrupt us, right? Not, not, I mean, at least have the decency to come and like stand for a minute. Mm -hmm. and jump in right you just gonna jump in and say my name is john blah 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 take it over i just i just never liked that right and so no. me i could never do that i just think it's rude right yeah and like i never i really don't really like you know like you said i don't like work the room so to speak right i used mm -hmm. to sit in the table what what i what i do has worked for me i learned this like about a year ago like suppose an event starts at 7 p.m if i get to 7 20 i might as well leave right because i'm not talking to one so what i do 
it starts at 7 p.m. I get there at 6.40 and people walk in. Or maybe backtrack. What I try to do, I try to research who's going to be there, right? You know, try to get a list of names, you know, quote unquote, stalk them on LinkedIn, right? I want to talk to this person, I want to talk to that person. And when they come in, I introduce myself, right? And so I, I try to do that way, right, right? So I think mm -hmm. we both do kind of network in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't research who's going to be at things, but I will say my team in my office, they do. They're, they're savvy guys. They do a lot of research. Um, but let's go back. Is it two years now? Let's go back to the Mariners game. So we invited you to the Mariners game and you came. And if you remember that day, there's a stool that I warmed for the whole nine innings of that Mariners game that the Cubs destroyed the Mariners. Yeah, like something like 100 to zero. Is like <laughs> yeah. So as a Cubs fan, I'm okay with that. Um, but I didn't move. And it, if it weren't for my team saying, please talk to so-and-so or so-and-so, I wouldn't have. And to your point about if you're standing and you're already talking to someone, it's usually someone you know because it's a safe zone, and someone else walks up, my first thought is, oh, crap, what are you going to try to sell me? <laughs> so I say play to your strengths. I'm not good. I'm not comfortable and I don't want to be in group, large groups or networking or socializing that way. Even with my own friends, if I had a room full of friends and a hundred people are there, I'm still going to find a spot and find a safe zone. I'm not sure what that's about. Maybe therapy would uncover that for me. I don't know. What I am good at is setting a specific time with a specific purpose to have conversations with people. And I can do that. If it's five people, we can have the conversation or 12, but I need it to be planned, prescribed, ready with an agenda and a beginning and an ending rather than this awkward, are you going to pitch me? Am yeah. I going to pitch you? What are we doing? How's the weather? <laughs> How the Seahawks doing? You know, like uh, right? I don't like it. I don't either. All right, so back to entrepreneurship. Okay. So you started coming in 2008. Can you draw some parallels and lessons from 2008 to people starting their business now in our current situation? <laughs> well, don't pick a business that requires a lot of interaction <laughs> with one-on-one -on -one customers or people, right? I think every day right now about businesses that thought, oh, I'm going to start this business. It's going to be great for people, but it involves close personal interactions for whatever reasons. And I feel horribly for them. I think about people who decided to dive in and start a restaurant. Yeah. I can imagine you start a restaurant in December, 2019, COVID mm. hits. Oh, I can open the bit a business and then the looters hit you. Like I, I can't. And I think about, and my heart breaks for those people because what do they transition to? What, where do they go now? Especially man, like they could work somewhere for 30 years and they use their 401k retirement. They put all that in the business and it's just <laughs> poof gone. Yeah. I can't imagine. And it goes back to what I said about it's never too late to do something new. And I think there are thousands of people right now who built businesses that may have been fabulous that for whatever reason can't reopen or won't reopen that need to figure out what's the next step. I'm hoping that we'll get the opportunity to have some of those people because people who started their own business have the drive and the understanding yes, yes. that you may work 17 hours a day building something new, but they're okay with it because they've done it. But I, I can't imagine what that's like. So in today's world, starting a business, I mean, it's a great opportunity to say, what do you have to lose? Now's probably a great time to figure out what's the thing people need most now. What's the thing that's not shut down due to this virus and the chaos? And what's the thing that you can still build your own life and freedom and schedule? And honestly, 
insurance is a great opportunity. Yeah, I'm sure people realize this back in the Great Reset 2008, like um, Airbnb started, Instagram started, all the iconic companies started when like it was like bare bones, you know. It is, mm-hmm. you know, people have focus and drive, you know. Sometimes you have no, no backup plan. That's when you succeed the most, I think. Absolutely. The whole burn the bridge idea and you can't go back. If you set yourself up that you don't have a plan B, I sure hope you've got the guts in you to keep going because you'll need to. I mean, I'm sure people know that Airbnb started because they just want to rent out an extra bed, right? That's all it was. Yeah. It's something as simple as that. They had no idea, no plan to do VC money or billion dollar IPOs. Right. They just want to make extra money by renting out a bed. Right. Something as right. simple as that. And someone just, and there's plenty of people doing that right now. I think I want to believe. Yeah. Well, and think about right now. I mean, you provide tremendous HR services and look at the situations that they're all in. How do we keep our employees? How do we do more for our employees? I had someone call yesterday. What do I do if one of my employees gets hospitalized? Now they're thinking about the real exposure that they've got. And they're thinking about, are our benefits sufficient? And now is the time for people to be looking at what do they do that gets ahead of this crisis to be ready. And I love that I built a business that comes full circle to homelessness and working in shelter programs because my goal is how does a business owner do enough for an employee so that they won't find themselves in a homeless situation? And some people think, that's a leap. Why would that happen? It's really straightforward. If someone were to get the coronavirus and end up hospitalized and it's two weeks, two months, six months, whatever the case may be, how long does the employer keep them employed? How long does the employer pay 100% of their health insurance because the employee's not even working anymore, so they can't contribute anything to the premiums? And then what happens if that employee can't return to work, so they end up being let go? And then how do they continue paying their living expenses just to keep a roof over their head? And statistically, people are one paycheck away from not being able to make ends meet, right? So for me, I sleep really well at night right now, just knowing we have answers for all of those things so that if someone is in one of those situations and actually has employees and want to protect them more than what a medical plan does, we actually have a solution. And I love that because we can actually keep people from ending up bankrupt or homeless. And then we can show business owners how to do better while at the same time showing people how this might be a career option for them because the need is getting greater. It's not going away because of this virus. One thing that people don't realize or, or, they, or don't pay attention to, like when you become a business owner, you're, not, you're, you're responsible for your business, your employees, your employees' families, you know. I don't think a lot of business owners like take that consideration. Like when they hire someone, mm-hmm. they're hiring their family, right? Because that, that, mm-hmm. whatever you pay that, that employee, is, they're going to take care of their family, right? I, I think people don't take that into the equation. Well, think about it. If you have employees, even if you have 10 employees, and one of those employees gets cancer and can't work for six months, it's their spouse that's coming to that owner crying and saying, what are you going to do to help us? I can't pay the mortgage. We have the new medical costs that we owe now and our normal living expenses and there's no money coming in for any of those things, will you just give us a draw on his paycheck until he's back to work? And a business owner is not a bank. And they shouldn't be in the lending business. And then if you do for one, do for all. You open up the Pandora's box. <laughs> yeah, and that's risky. So yeah, you're right. Business owners that are mindful of their employees being more than just production for them, but are rather people with families. If they think about that, most of them would want to do more to protect their employees. So Laura Beth, let's go back to entrepreneurship. So being an entrepreneur is like not easy. (laughs) 
being a female entrepreneur has has it made it harder for you or has it been an advantage for you or what's your thoughts on that oh boy uh so a lot of people like the school of thought that it doesn't matter what race or gender or it, nothing matters the world is the same for everybody and that's not true being a woman has huge disadvantages in business but you can't let them remain disadvantages so you have different challenges i think if you will and i worked in a prison in a men's facility as a lieutenant so i know all about non-traditional female roles and interacting in those worlds it's challenging and you have to go home every day saying did he just call me sweetie did he just ask me to get coffee for him did he not take me seriously because i was a woman did they not think i'm qualified to be a lieutenant in a prison because i'm a woman um but it goes back to what we've been talking about if you're gonna cave and give up because of those challenges you'll never achieve any real success so I've always faced it head on and it's difficult sometimes. So what are business owners and especially small business owners getting wrong about benefits? Oh, great question. That if they provide medical, maybe dental and vision that they've done enough. I actually had a business owner say to me recently, it's not my job to do anything else for them. If I provide the medical, I've done what I'm supposed to do. That's not true. You're getting it wrong entirely. Medical is a given in most employment. Employees report, they're not looking at medical plans. They're looking at what are the other options. Business owners are getting it wrong when they think all I'm responsible for is medical and they don't understand that there's some responsibility and helping their employees meet their other needs. So their emotional stability, because financially, 70% of employees say they're stressed at work because of finances. So having plans in place that help with financial literacy, budgeting, credit, uh, debt consolidation, whatever that might be, having those things available is critical to having employees that are happy at work and can be good employees and contribute because they're not distracted. Um, business owners are getting it wrong if they think my broker said, all I need is this medical dental vision and we're fine. And they're getting it wrong if they don't entertain the conversation about more information and then process that information and make a decision. So for the business owners I talk to, who immediately say, I'm not interested, I don't want to hear what you all do, they're getting it wrong. Because information is king to being successful and leading in your industry and recruiting and retaining good employees. So at least gathering the information puts them on the right step. Then they can make whatever decisions they need to. So I'm hearing you say, you're a business owner, have great benefits plan, that's going to give you a great employer brand. It's going to help you recruit great talent, correct? And retain them. And retain them, yes. Mm -hmm. Because employees report in surveys that are done that they are looking for new jobs in the same industry for less pay if the benefits would be better. And better means not just medical dental vision. It doesn't mean a better medical plan or a better dental plan. It means better benefits, which mean, means things that people didn't consider. I have a client that has almost 7,000 employees. And that client said to me, we have A through Z in benefits for our people. And obviously they have a big budget for those benefits. And they said, so show us what it is you do that's different that we're missing. So I did. They also said, we're going to listen to what you're going to show us and tell us is different, 
we won't be making any decisions this year, but maybe next year we'll consider what you're telling us is different. Maybe we'll add something in a year, not this year. I spent an hour, about an hour and a half, sharing with them what we offer, what we do, and why it's different than what they are doing. And just gave them the information. And within three weeks, they were rolling out our new benefits for 7,000 employees because they took the time to get the information and understood it was actually a missing piece in their puzzle. So I think a lot of people think benefits are confusing. Mm. Are benefits really confusing or people just need to take the time to research it or are benefits really confusing? Benefits are very confusing. And no, people shouldn't take time to research that. Is it confusing to fix the siding on a house and fix a leak and then paint it and have it match and figure it out? I don't want to figure that out. I'm not going to YouTube it and start doing all of it and hope I get it right. I'm going to call a professional who's trained or licensed or bonded and have them do it because they understand it and they can explain it to me what they're doing and why it's costing me thousands of dollars. Well, insurance is the same way or even more so important that you have an advisor. An insurance agent, like a real estate agent, has to go through grueling licensing testing. So you've got to pass these tests, but then every two years, you have to prove that you're still competent and that you understand whatever has changed in the insurance industry. As a result, you know this stuff. So benefits are confusing. The solution isn't tell the employees to do more research, give them more things to study before they make benefit choices. The solution is bring in an, a professional licensed and trained to have a conversation with those employees to help them understand before they make decisions. What is a benefits broker and what's their responsibility? <laughs> oh, so a benefits broker is someone whose job is to look at all of the options based on the business that needs the benefit and come up with the best solution for that company based on needs, cost, et cetera. And if you're truly brokering that, you're going to look at all of the options. So I often tell businesses, if you have an agent from one carrier that walks in the door and says, I work for Kaiser, I only sell Kaiser, and you should have Kaiser, a business should be suspicious of that because they can't tell you about the other companies and the value of those other companies and what the right thing might be. And so a, a true broker is someone who can lay out the landscape, look at needs, look at cost analysis, and then find the right match for that particular business. Is there like some kind of test they need to take? Or is like Yeah, to have an insurance license and all brokers have to have licenses. You take a test, which some people it takes three or four or five or seven times to pass. It's not easy. Um, <clears throat> but just because you're licensed in something doesn't mean- Yeah, everyone can't know how to drive a car, right? Yeah, yeah, just because you have a driver's license. Oh, I followed them on my way here. Uh, just because a broker is licensed to sell insurance doesn't mean that they're going to do exactly the right thing for their customers. So how do you convince business owners any benefits? Like, let me ask this another way. You're talking to business owner. When do you in your mind say, okay, I'm wasting my time. This business owner, they don't get it. Or there's no, way I can invest my time. Like, what's your time limit? Do you like continually go back and back and back? Or what's the point where you say, okay, this guy doesn't care about benefits. Mm -hmm. I need to move on and, you know. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, because of my life 
which is similar to yours, I think you kind of have this pit bell mentality. Don't let go. Yeah. Don't give up. Don't let go. Keep going. And so to a fault, I tend to not give up. But I can tell you I've learned a lot in the last year or so about this phrase we use, which is fire a client or fire a prospect, where you might be pursuing a business owner and you might know they have serious needs and you have solutions for those needs, but there might be a reason that it's not a good idea if that moves forward. So I have a particular account that we pursued for quite some time and we thought it would be a great partner with us. And we finally moved that needle and moved it forward to, we're gonna do business together. But it was a fight like crawling on cactus, every interaction. And we still thought, well, we've worked so hard, we wanted this partnership, we've got it. And within the first couple of weeks, it imploded. And we all sat back and said, we should have known that that was one that we should have just stopped. But the red flags were there. It was, the, the flags were there. I think the bombs were exploding the entire <laughs> time. It was like we ran into the explosions. We could do this. And we could. But you can't help someone who is so stuck in that pride or the ego. I know best. You can't show me. You can't change that. And do you want to? Uh, we want clients who, when we give them the initial information, if they process that and they have the same value for their employees, we want clients like that so that we can help them. Um, you don't want someone who flat out says to you, I don't care about my employees. I do enough for them already. So I don't care what you add. And I had someone say that to me. So to your point, you know, employers are responsible for the whole family because the families rely on that, that income. Some employers don't think that, and those are usually employers we don't fit well with. Yes. So I know your company does, has customers <laughs> from, a, from, from a small as 10 people to as big as 10,000, mm -hmm. but is there a certain size or type or location of industry you like to focus on? So we have done a lot of work in the manufacturing and aerospace industry, those two industries. And as you know, the aerospace industry is hitting a really rough spot right now. Um, we still serve those industries and we love our clients in those industries. We love blue collar workers, hardworking Americans that are just trying to provide for their families. We wanna make sure that they're never in the situation of losing everything they've worked hard for because their medical won't do enough for them. Uh, so we love those, but we don't limit that. I have a client that has three employees, husband, wife, and a grown son. Uh, ideally, you know, 20 to 200 people is a good business partner for us but we don't turn any away. Uh, we enrolled six new businesses in the last two months that were all under 30 employees. I could be wrong, but all your marketing is, is organic, right? Like you're not doing any paid advertising or paying for any market. Everything's organic, correct? Everything is organic, everything. Yeah. So how have you been able to make that work for yourself? Hmm. I know you're pretty big on social media too. Mm -hmm. So um, I've spent a lot of time and money I believe in coaches, I believe in trainings, I believe in conferences, I believe in networking with people who have been successful to get a feed off of what they're doing and their suggestions. So over the last five years, I've paid a lot of money to attend conferences and events and things. And when we really understand the power of social media, that it's not really for a picture of your dinner, uh, those sometimes we do that because it's just amazing food 
I think we did it at a Texas barbecue recently. Um, but when you realize social media is the best way to reach people, and right now with every business running limited business, and you can't get in and interact with people, social media is even more important. Then you can't just think, oh, I'm going to just post on social that I do benefits. Someone should reach out to me. That's not how social media works. And so Bend and Sway and that podcast really is a lot of focus on how do you use social media for your business. And we spend a lot of time and money hiring professionals and reading books and attending programs to learn how to use it so that it's good for your business, but so that it also builds organic, authentic relationships. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta add value and you, you gotta target it right. I mean, <laughs> I mean like, you're not going to like do it like a targeted, you know, social media post on like a, I don't know, something random that has nothing to do with your race. Right. Or has nothing to do with the businesses that we want to serve. But if I go back to that Mariners game a couple of years ago that we hosted the suite and we invited people, we've actually created some interactions with people that feel more like friendships that you can check in and ask, how are you going? How are you doing? What's going on with you? And it's not about, can you generate business for me or can I generate business for you? That comes when you build that relationship. So we spend a lot of time on social building relationship. There's nothing that chaps my hide more than seeing a connection request on LinkedIn. And I, I, my finger hovers over like, do I dare? Do I dare? And I hit accept. And in 30 seconds, I've got a novel of what they sell, what they do, and why I need it. And what's worse, it's in all caps, yes. single space, hunter font. Or it ends with, there's never a question in there about what I do and do I need it. It ends with, do you have time for us to talk? Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So the person who sent me one last week, <laughs> that all it said was, can we chat? immediately after I accepted it, who then this morning tried a different approach. I'm still not answering. I hesitate to block people. I feel like it's a little aggressive. Yeah. But it, there's no honest organic value. I mean, I, I just, give you the benefit of that. Maybe they're trained wrong or this is how their boss is telling them to do you know. So I give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot for me to block someone, but yeah. 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 So your annual baseball game, yeah. Obviously, you're not doing that this year. Now, how many years have you done the baseball game? Four years. Four years. So it's a great event. How are you going to like recapture that this year without doing the event? Like, how do you? Because that a lot of a lot of that's the missed yeah. opportunity right there. How do you how do you do that? Yeah. Well, we want to do it, and we want to we want to do something similar. What that event is just meant to be is an annual event of existing clients who are very, very happy, prospects that we're hoping will someday be a client, and industry leaders that we respect and we want to be able to have everyone in the same circle, having a good time and celebrating where we are and where we're going. So obviously we can't have that gathering now. And we've all sat back and said, maybe next month, maybe next month, maybe the next, is it a golf tournament? What are we going to do? So we're still waiting. So in the meantime, we really up our social media. Uh, if the only way we can group with people and talk with people is on social, we'll do that. And for the listeners who are going to listen to this later on when I post out this podcast, today is Wednesday, July the 8th, 2020, just for some perspective when you listen to this. <laughs> Um, I don't think I talk about the bio, but talk about the Puget Sound. I think it's Puget Sound Business Magazine. Puget Sound, Puget Sound Business Journal. Journal. Leadership Trust. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a group of people that are vetted by the Puget Sound Business Journal. And they have to be owners or CEOs, top C-level people at companies that have to have at least 2 million in business or more annually. 
And then they interact as business leaders and they connect with all the business journals around the country. So all the cities are given access to a, a private app that everyone can share information. And then they post articles and they pose questions for business owners and people can respond um, kind of like a, the best practices, if you will. For businesses. So pretty big deal then, right? Yeah, it's a nice deal. Mm -hmm. Next, let's talk about sales. So I think a lot of people start businesses, they want to build a product, deliver a service, do whatever case it be. Sales, what's that? I'm, I don't have to do sales. I'm yeah. so great. I'm my product, you know, like I open a restaurant, my spaghetti is so great, this is going to come, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think small, a lot of small business owners, to include myself, like I'm not scared of sales, but like they're apprehensive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, part of they don't hear rejection, but how do you recommend people to get over that, right? I love that. Well, first, I will always recommend that anyone who wants to be solid and comfortable in sales, follow Jeb Blunt. He's a guru. He is just a really smart person who's happy to share his experience and knowledge with people. And it was a game changer for me. Now to sales and anyone who says to me, oh, I'm not sales. I'm not good at sales. I can't do sales. I call BS. The three-year-old that whines and cries and pleads for a cookie and gets that cookie is in sales. The the person who wants to go out on a date with the person and wants to convince them to go where they want to go is in sales. You know, where do you want to go tonight for dinner, honey? Burgers? No, I really want Italian. Well, the salesperson is going to close that deal and get to eat where they want to eat. And sometimes, obviously, it's just as passive as wherever you want to go, right? But sometimes it's a person saying, I really don't want that and here's why. And the other person saying, but I really do think we should do that and here's why. And that's sales. I spend all of my time talking to business owners and their employees who think, I really don't want that or need that. And me responding with, but you really do. And let me show you why. That's a sales process. Um, I learned early on, people don't like rejection, but if you don't view it as rejection, it doesn't bother you. When you take it out of the equation of it's you personally, and it's simply someone who didn't understand what you were trying to tell them or the value you brought, or they're not a good fit, and you just move on, it eliminates the sting of rejection. Yeah, but it's so hard for people to do that though, right? Sure it is. Sure it is. Uh, you could, uh, <laughs> I mean, if you hammer on your hand enough times, it's not going to hurt as much <laughs> the next time. It's like a workout. If you work out and you're tearing down muscle, it hurts. And you don't want to go work out the next day because it hurts. So if you're making calls and it hurts, and they're telling you, take me off your list. Don't ever call me again. If I'm anyone answers the in the first place. <laughs> yeah true but if you do it again the next day it hurts less and if you do it again the next day and the next it hurts less every time and at that point you take a list you dial phone numbers you tell them why it's important it doesn't hurt at all yeah you build up what's called a, you build up the muscle memory that's right yeah so laura beth how do you go about bringing people to your team like how, what characteristics and values you look for in the people you hire I'm connected to somebody in the HR world on LinkedIn besides you, but I saw them post something recently about don't ever ask these questions in an interview and only ask these questions. And I giggled because my questions weren't on there. Here's what I want to know if someone's interested in joining our team. <clears throat> Tell me something that was so difficult that you paused long enough to say, I don't think I can do this. I got to quit. And then you ultimately didn't quit and you finished. 
Tell me what that was. And I've had people I've talked to have said it was college. They wanted to quit. We have a professional rugby player on our team now. So it's, it's sports for some people and they want to quit, but they really want to play in the championship game. So they don't quit. So I want to know, is this person, I don't want them to be me, but is there any level of sure things are hard? Sure. I've wanted to quit. I didn't let myself. And then what was that thing that they held on to the grit and the ter- determination to push through? Cause if they can tell me that story and I can look in their face and see them reflecting on what it felt like and then what they achieved or accomplished, those are the kind of people I want. So you're looking for some, res- some kind of resiliency then. Grit. Grit. Mm-hmm. Stick yeah. to itiveness, what do you want to call it? Stick to itiveness. Um, even if you curl up and cry or shed a tear, it's okay to do that. But will you dry the tear and go right back to the thing that you committed to? So let's say you hire someone and you think it's a great hire. Mm-hmm. But you soon find out this isn't the best hire that you made a mistake. Mm-hmm. How long do you like work with this person? Like you like do performance plans, you give them six months a year or you're like, okay, this person has to go sooner than later. I think a lot of employ- employers like made a mistake of like trying to like be the good guy. Mm-hmm. I don't want to fire him because it's Christmas birthday, mm-hmm. but the, you know, because all the employees know that employee needs to go. Right. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a firm believer if you're a business owner, if you think someone should go, your employees have known that for a long time. Yeah. So how do you, what's your cutoff? How do you and, do that? And then your employees are looking at you like, well, how valuable am I if I'm doing everything I should and I'm doing it right. And then this other one, you're just letting them hang on like a wart kind of it's up there obnoxious, right? A wart is not fun. Um, and sometimes you have to remove it for the good of the team as well. But here's the other thing for that person. So you're not really letting people go. You're actually giving them grace and permission to move on to the thing that is obviously better suited. Yeah, for I them. completely agree. You can release them to go to a better opportunity. Absolutely. Um, but I firmly believe in an interaction that's open and transparent about what do I think is not working? What does that person think is not working? What do I think would have to happen for it to work? And what do they think would have to happen? And if those can line up and it looks like there's potential to fix that, then opportunity is something I'm going to always extend to people. At the point that they don't seem to understand that it's not working or it's not improving, I think you have an obligation to release them to go find something that is working. And ultimately, what do we all do every day? Try to make a living. So if you're in a business like ours and you're not succeeding, you're not making a living. And so if you're not making a living, why would you continue doing it? I completely agree. So you said earlier that you're, you're, you just turned 54, you're about to turn 54? I just turned. Mm-hmm. So how, talk about how you still have focus and drive at 54. Cause a lot of people, are you in the fifties, you should be winding down, you know, breaking out the golf clubs, you know, Bring out the rocking chair. How is it you see up all this driving focus? Yeah. I just posted on somebody's Instagram today that I know that I really respect that as an entrepreneur, your goal is typically I want to build a life that allows me to adjust my schedule so I don't need to retire. I can do what I want to when I want to. And prior to this year, I had built my life that every single month involved a vacation, a getaway. Whether it was three days or four days, it was every month. Whether it was a drive or flight, every month. I drove past the SeaTac airport sign last night on I-5. And (laughs) out loud, I looked at the sign and I said, oh, SeaTac, how I miss you. And then I started thinking, when was the last time I was on a plane? And it was January. I paid a pretty penny to attend a conference in Florida. While I was there, Kobe Bryant died. 
the front page of the USA Today with Kobe Bryant in the center. I had an article about the coronavirus left of him. I had no idea where we were going. I canceled multiple trips that I already had booked. And I've driven hundreds and hundreds and thousands of miles to try to still get some getaways. But now when I get away, nothing's open for me to go do anything. And so at 54, I don't see any signs of a lot of people I know are retiring. I went to high school with people, a lot of them did the job that had retirement or pensions and stuck with it. So they're all retiring now. And I don't feel like I'm missing anything. I don't know why I would stop doing what I do that's very fulfilling when I can just reduce or adjust anytime I need to. Yes. So what's your vision for your company? Mm. So my personal vision, and I have a, my partner in business, we talk about what we're doing, where we're going. And since he's a millennial and got so many more years to contribute to that, my vision is that we have multiple locations and that we have people who are running those particular offices that have the same vision and mission and commitment that we do. So the business just continues going. And then when I'm no longer here on this earth, the business continues going. And it's a legacy that I worked for and created that now affects even more people. And employees around the country will never stop needing what we provide. And frankly, we'll probably only need more as it continues. Uh, and so what I want to do while I'm doing this actively, when I stop doing it or when I die, is know that I'm impacting hardworking, everyday Americans in a way that provides a safety net for them, that I somehow protected them. Laura Beth, can you, you talk about this a little bit? Can you explain more detail, detail exactly what your company does? Sure. So we go in and meet with business owners and do a consulting assessment. How many employees do they have? What do they currently offer those employees? Are they aware of some compliance and taxability issues that I can tell you out of 400 clients, I've had three that were actually compliant with some Department of Labor requirements. Uh, so we do a consulting assessment. We look at all of those things, and then we provide three main resources. One is, how do you expand your employee benefits without expanding the budget? So we provide no cost benefits to every company we work for. Then we look at compliance. Do they need those pieces? And we provide that compliance at no cost to the company. And then we look at what are their current expenses for business benefits, employee benefits, those services, and could they be doing better with their benefits and saving money? So we look at cost saving strategies. I can say I have a long list of reference letters from companies that have saved anywhere between $45,000 a year on their benefit costs, up to one of them that saved $156,000 a year. That is by modifying their plan, reducing their expenses as a business, and improving the benefits that their employees get every single time. That's great. Laura Beth, can you, uh Put out your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you. So the best way to reach us is really uh, leveragebenefit.com. Our website has some of the information, has a contact us link, uh, has my email and phone number there. We're on LinkedIn, uh, which is just leverage benefits. 
I personally have LinkedIn, which is Laura Beth. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. All of those social sites are listed on our website. So it's really the best resource to figure out how to connect to us by going to leveragebenefit.com. And to our listeners, we have all her social media links on our show notes, and you can find the show notes at www.cabinetstatechoblaw.com. And be sure to share this episode with your, with, your, with your friends. So we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Hmm. My last minute wisdom is that when the sky is falling and it seems like we're in a complete state of chaos, professionally, personally, nationally, it is not true. We are not in that state unless we own that state. Put the umbrella up. Don't let the sky fall on you. Dig deep for some strength and reach out to people who can keep encouraging you when you start feeling overwhelmed in this time. Laura Beth, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.